Hello and welcome. I'm Rana Naravitsky Pilzer, the Educational Director of the Jewish Israeli Identity Center at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. The Institute is a pluralistic think tank and educational center for the Jewish people. Our mission is to strengthen Jewish peoplehood, identity, and pluralism, to enhance the Jewish and democratic character of Israel, and to ensure that Judaism is a compelling force for good in the 21st century. You can find more about us, as well as more of our videos, articles, and podcasts at shalomhartman.org. We're here at the Hartman campus in Jerusalem, and I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Rachel Korazim. Rachel teaches at Israel's well-known learning centers, such as Shalom Hartman Institute and Pardes. Since 1990, she has invested a lot of her time and energy in helping emerging Jewish schools of Hungary. Rachel is also a very active grandmother of eight grandchildren who all live in Israel. Rachel, we're very happy to hear from you today, please. Shalom and welcome again. I know you know my name already. I was introduced. Let me repeat it, the name is Rachel, just in case you attempted to think about it as Rachel. That would be a big mistake. I was born here in Israel way before Israel was born. A little bit of my personal story will come into our talk today. The other thing that I'd like to add about myself is that I love teaching about Israel through its literature, and that should do for now. And now I'd like to ask you to train and focus your attention on the PowerPoint slide that I have prepared for you. There are four things that I need for you to look at. One, of course, is that we are part of the Shalom Hartman Summer Program 2020. That's extremely important, but you know that already. And now look at the title, Nathan Alterman. I will pronounce it the Hebrew way. I will not call him Nathan. You'll have to excuse me for that. And then you need to see the title, the magician, parentheses, of words and images. We will talk about that. The bard, the storyteller of our national story, and the whistleblower. This will be the chosen, these will be the chosen three foci of my talk to you today about Alterman. And then the additional thing that I will need for you to pay attention to is on the right-hand side of your slide and probably just underneath the picture and the dates. And that is a picture not of from a public library. This is my home, ladies and gentlemen. And this is one of the three shelves of Nathan Alterman related books I have at home, not in a public library. Am I bragging to you? No. This is my way of telling you that talking for one hour about Alterman is a huge effort, not how to fill the hour, but what are the few cherries that I will pick of the abundant material that I would have had to choose from. Last but not least, you have, of course, Nathan Alterman's sort of graffiti picture, but underneath are the dates, 1910 to 1970. So first you can gather that he was not even 60 when he had passed, and also that the year 70 says that we are marking this year the 50th anniversary of his passing. This is a lecture in honor of that. Enough introductions and let us start. We will start like always teacher do at our table of content. We will hopefully be looking at the following pieces of Alterman's work. On the high road, moon of all the people, a response to an Italian captain, the reprimand to Tawafik Tubi, and the valley song. And now I know, I so know what's in your head, some of you. Is she not going to talk about the silver platter? How can we have an Alterman lecture and not mention the one poem that most of us know? Well, this is the reason. I thought that I have spoken so often about the silver platter that I wanted to use this festive occasion to go a little bit beyond. You can find lots of stuff, including mine, about the silver platter. So don't be disappointed. This stuff will be good, at least as good. And now a little bit of biography. So we are starting with a family picture, and I circled the little Nathan, 
a, among his family members. So he has a sister, dad and mom, and a grandmother. Grandmother, extremely important because she is the one who raised him for many, many years. Father was a very busy Jewish educator back in Poland. And the mother, believe it or not, at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, a woman, Jewish, in Poland, Warsaw, was a doctor, a physician, a dentist. There were not too many of those. But this is to say that mom and dad were extremely busy and the raising of children was left to grandma. Natan Alterman was born in Warsaw, but look at the signs like sort of the milestones that I am putting on the way. Between the year he was born in 1910 and the year 1925, when the family reaches Tel Aviv, when he is 15, this is when the family makes Aliyah to British Mandate Palestine. I'd like you to pull out from our collective Jewish memory and calendar, just look at these years, 1910 to 1925. Obviously, they are all pre-Holocaust, we know that. But they include the Kishinev pogrom. They include the major immigration to the States. They include World War I. They include the Russian Revolution. And in all these years, the family is moving around. Nathan Alterman's childhood was not a very peaceful one. This is probably the only thing I have time to point out to you as we look. Obviously, there is much more about his biography on the net and in books. I just wanted to give you the highlights and to focus the thinking over that period. So they arrive in Tel Aviv and I try to find a picture as close as possible to the year of their arrival. And when in Tel Aviv, he is still young enough to be enlisted in Gymnasia Herzliya. I know enough English to have said the Gymnasia or the Herzliya High School, but I wanted you to have the name as we used to call it. It still exists in a different building, albeit <coughs> in Tel Aviv. Uh, this is a fully Hebrew program, of course, and uh, Nathan Alterman is a student of Gymnasia Herzliya of the time, and he becomes straight from the beginning a Tel Aviv person. So I'd like to, you to think about that Tel Aviv person statement from two different angles. Many of you, when you think about Israeli cultural aspects, Israeli writers, etc., you think Jerusalem. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there are some cultural people who live in Tel Aviv. There's another thing that you may think. Somebody making Aliyah in the 20s, they are sort of pioneers. They should be in the kibbutz. Well, think again. Not everybody went to a kibbutz. So Nathan Altonan is neither Yerushalayim nor kibbutz. We need to think differently about this person. And now let's place him in the cultural world. So the generation before him is this huge luminaries, Bialik and Chernikhovsky. Bialik will die in 1934, will arrive to the land of Israel in 24. So by the time the young Alterman arrives in 25, wow, it's the scene of your Bialik and Chernikhovsky, okay? So that's the generation on whose shoulders the Nathan Alterman generation will be standing. Now let us look at his co-people of his time. So the big man at the time is Avram Shlonsky, next to him Alexander Penn, but soon enough Alterman will sort of become the giant of this group to be later joined by Leah Goldberg as well. This team with a few others is called Chavorat Yachad. They also have a publishing house of their own. And again, I'm trying to think that what some of you may be thinking back home as I'm saying these words. So Rachel, where are all these poets and writers that I know about? Where is Amichai? Where is Amos Oz? Where is Natan Zach, etc.? I will say this is the following generation, okay? So you want to think of the Natan Alterman age group and the Yachad group as the people who rebel against the Bialiks and Chernikhovskis, and you want to think about the Natan Zachs and Yudha Amichais as the people who rebelled against the Shlonsky 
and the Altermans, okay? This is where we are more or less time-wise and cultural timeline wise. Let's just talk about our gentleman. Nathan Alterman was a full-time writer, yet he held a day position, which oddly enough, excuse the language, was a night editor at the Devar paper, before that at the Haaretz paper. He was, of course, a very important lyrical poet. And he was and will become the national poet, albeit from Tel Aviv. You remember, national poet and not from Jerusalem. When we are looking again now at my table and cough content, that you can see that I have divided the pieces, the poetry that I want to address myself to according to these three lines. So on the high road and moon will belong to the lyrical poetry of Alterman, the, of all the people, a response to an Italian captain and the reprimand to Tawafik Tubi will be linked to his journalistic work. I will add now an expression in Hebrew, translating immediately. Alterman has an amazing body of lyrical poetry, but a huge, add three times the word huge, body of poetry that relates to contemporary events. He had his own column in the paper, first in Haaretz, then for 30 years in the Var. There are 700 such pieces where Alterman weekly reflects on contemporary events. He used to relate to this body of his poetry as Shirei Ha'et Ve'ha'iton. Et, not pan, but time, itim la Torah, as you would say. So the poetry of time and the newspaper. In Hebrew, the two words sound alike, Shirei Ha'et Ve'ha'iton. And the valley song will be probably in that category that I will call the national poet, trying to include people who link to Natalia Alterman from far away from across the ocean. So this is <coughs> my mission for today, for the next 15 minutes. I think it's time to get started with some poetry on top of all these words of introduction. I am starting my venture into the lyrical poet aspect of Nathan Alterman, not by putting a text in front of you, but putting a date in front of you and the title of the book. So the date is February 18, 1938. I'm not exaggerating. I'm relying on the best of the literary scholars in Israel names such as Professor Hirschfeld from Hebrew U, names such as Professor Zdan Laor from Tel Aviv University and Professor Ziva, Ziva Shamir from the Ben-Gurion University. I could continue and give you all my reference. All of them relate to this particular date as a watershed event, not only in the history of Israeli poetry, but maybe in the history of Israeli literature altogether, and for sure in the history of 20th century Hebrew writing. What's so special about the date is the date when Alterman publishes his first book of poetry. Let there be no confusion. He did publish poetry, lyrical poetry before, but this is the first book. It is called Kochavim Bachutz, Stars Outside, and you can see the cover page and you can see the inside cover, a very simple, modest publication. The exterior of this first edition is no testimony of its importance. Iton Devar, his paper already by that time, will have a short description of the fact that the book had appeared and you have also an ad that where you can get the book and how you can buy it. No digital formats yet in 1938, I'm sorry to tell you. Before we indulge ourselves in two of the poems of Kochavim Bechutz, I'd like to add two comments. We all have that Jewish calendar in our heads and the year is 1938, and Hitler is already in power for five years. 
and Chamberlain is just to come back from Munich with that promise of peace for our times. In the land of Israel, we have the great Arab rebellion and we have terrorist acts. We call them in Hebrew, the events, Hameoraot. And the question arises, if Alterman, one of our greatest lyrical poets, is publishing a poetry book, is it in any way linked to the historical events? So if you leaf through the book, you will be really forced to, to work hard in order to discern connections. And yet when Alterman was asked about it, he would say a poet is never disconnected from the reality around him. So we will try to put here and there a magnifying glass over a certain line, beautiful and lyrical, and yet maybe foreshadowing some of the events to come. So we are opening Kochavim Bachutz. Need I tell you that my generation, being well over 70, this is one of the books we all had. This will be a book that a first boyfriend at 16 will bring you as a gift. This will be a book a girl of 15 or 14 will get for her birthday. This is what we read in high school. By the way, there are Israeli songs that refer to people who are reading Kochavim Bachotz. I can teach you about that in another class, not today. We are opening, and I wanted to add an artistic picture just in case. But Derech Let us hear the Hebrew read to you. It's a short one, so I can afford the time. And then we will discuss it in English. Of course, reread it in English. But Derech in Belim Bamire Ushrikot Vesade Bazahav Ad Erev, Dumiat Beerot Yerukot Merchavim Sheli Vaderch, Haetzim Shalum in Hatal Nitsutsim Kizhuchit Umatechit, Lehabit Loichdal, Velin Shom Loichdal, Veamut Veosif Lelechit, on the highway. There's a tinkling in the pasture and the whistling. And the field lies in gold till evening, a hush of green wells, my wide open spaces and the road. The trees riven from the dew gleam like glass and metal. I shall never stop looking, I shall never stop breathing, and I shall die and will keep going. You know what I like to do sometimes, because you know I'm that awful Israeli, is to show you how much you lose by not having Hebrew. Look at the first word, words in English. There is a tinkling, which I'll get, onomatopoeic, speaks about the sound of tinkling. But the Hebrew first word is in balim, plural for in bal, which is the clapper, the tongue of a bell. So the Hebrew reader is not called upon to listen like there is a tinkling, but rather to combine view of the shape of the inbal, the clapper, and the sound. And the Hebrew starts with this musical instrument, rather with the drush of there is tinkling. The English is not really a translation. It's a drush on the original word. So much lost. Okay. In Belim Bamir'e Usharikot, the Hebrew has a lot of the R here, and the field lies gold till evening. The hush of green wells. Look at the Alterman shift from the outside, the fields, the sound of the clappers, the tongues of the bells, and then suddenly so Altermanish looking inside, in depth. You were just walking on the field. You did not even notice that you reached a well, and then suddenly you are focusing on the inside. That's a first invitation to Alterman. It's always about depth. It's always about going deep while embracing. It's not just the open spaces. It's Shelly, it's mine and the road. What we want to remember from here is the word road or even the highway or the high road because Alterman's lyrical poetry 
He is rarely stable. He is always the one who is walking through, the, always the one on the road. <clears throat> let us just pay attention, let the imbal go away. Pay attention to the highway, so important in Alterman's poetry. It's always about roads. And then I want to invite you to the second verse. The trees risen from the dew. Is there a reminiscent, you know, reference to the Song of Songs, to Shira Shirim, as the beloved one is coming out of the bath of washing? Maybe. So the trees that risen from the dew, not sure if it's morning dew, maybe nightfall, gleam like glass and metal. And you wouldn't expect me to stop, would you? But I have to stop to show you again. You remember I called him the magician of words? Because normally, when you equate something to something, you will take something artificial, like glass, like metal, that is man-made, and you want to talk about its beauty, you will compare it to nature, not Alterman, the other way around. He sees the dew on the trees, and he is thinking about glass and metal. Did I not tell you he was a city man? For him, the basic is the city, the glass and the metal, and everything out there on the big road is just reminiscent. And now we come to probably what is the reason for me to choose this particular one out of the 60 odd poems of Starts Outside, and these are the last two lines. I shall never stop looking, I shall never stop breathing, and I shall die and will keep going. Why am I choosing these particular two lines? Because up till these last two lines, this could have ended with a meeting of a beautiful girl on the road. It could have ended with a beautiful sunset, with maybe those famous stars starting to twinkle. No. As of the first poem that I'm introducing you to, the presence of this generation is there, no matter what Altman does in his lyrical poetry. You are alive, yet death is a constant present. Later critique, coming back to this early poetry, will tell you, yes, obviously, this is the generation that had parents who just survived World War I, and then they will have to survive World War II and the Holocaust, and then the Israeli generation will have to survive the War of Independence that took such a huge number of victims. Death is a constant presence. They will see in the Alterman early poetry a sort of a foreshadowing, a sort of a prophetic view that or oftentimes we see in Alterman's poetry, very often. I will show you two more examples. So here it is in one of the most beautiful love of nature poems, not forgetting the city, and already putting in front of this generation the constant reminder of the presence of death. Let us leave the great highway and go to a not less famous poem of this collection, Stars Outside. It's called Moon. Yeah, I know it comes next to the stars. You probably wanted me to talk about the stars, but I'd like to focus on Moon and you will see why. Let us do the first verse at least in Hebrew, because you know why? Because my generation can recite these poems by heart. Yerach. גם למראה נושן יש רגע של הולדת, שמיים לציפור, זרים ומבוצרים. בלילה הסהור מול חלונך עומדת, עיר טבולה בבכי הצרצרים. An old sight too has its moment of birth. A birdless sky, it should have been one word, I know that, but this is how the official translation shows it. A birdless sky, strange and set apart. Facing your window on the moonlit night stands a city plunged in cricket's tears. And when you see a rose still watching for a wayfarer, 
and the moon on its cypress pear. You say, my God, are these things still out there? May one whisper them a greeting. From their pools the water gaze upon us. The tree is at rest. In flush of catkin blossoms, never shall the sorrow of your great playthings be plucked from me, our God. In Hebrew, Le'olam lo te'aker mimeni Eloheinu, tugat tsa'atsu echa hagdulim. Let us start looking a little bit into detail into this poem. First of all, remember how I qualified this part of my presentation, the magician of words. Altman has an unbelievable ability to make you wonder afresh at common things. This simple statement, even an old sight has a moment of birth, calls upon you to look at the banal, at the daily, at that that you will not turn to look at again because you know it so well. It can be a person you share your life with. It can be the house you live in. It can be the tree planted in front of your house that you had walked by twice a day for 30 years. Doesn't matter. Altman says, look again. And old sight too has its moment of birth. Remember that as you walk through life. In a birdless sky, strange and set apart. That, you know, that mundane every day. Okay. Facing your window on the moonlit night stands a city plunged in cricket tears. I need for you to look at the Hebrew for a minute, the last line of the first verse. Ir tvula bivchi hatsarsarim. A city plunged. I'm not sure how the English translates well the absurdity of the statement. Because to be tvula, as we do at Passover, you know, matbilim, twice you know the word from the Manishtana, is to go into liquid. But the cricket's tears, the cricket's sound is not a liquid, it's not the tears in the Hebrew, it's the bechi, it's the sound of the crickets. So how can a sound be equated to a liquid in which you plunge yourself. Alterman can. He can make you think about a sound as if it was a pool of sound that you immerse yourself in it. And a similar thing will happen in the next verse. And when you see a road still watching for a wayfarer, seriously? Is the, the way watching. For us normal people, it's the helich, it's the wayfarer who is watching the road, not by Alterman. By Alterman, everything can be it and its reverse. In his world, you're passing by, the road looks at you. And the moon is on the cypress spear. Hayareach al kidon habrosh. Did you catch that moment when you look outside your window? It's a regular moon, and the cypher had been there for ages, and yet, now for the first time, because even a banal sight has a moment of birth, and suddenly it looks as if the moon is on a spear, on Kidon Habrosh, and you are totally in awe. Oh, wow, God! Are these things still out there? May I whisper them a greeting? You are in awe of the most regular. Okay, again, the waters are looking rather than us looking at them. And then we will have this eternal commitment, just like in the first song, The Great Highway. We saw that statement about going beyond life into death. Here there is an eternal commitment that says, I will never stop wondering at the sorrow of those great playthings that God had created. 
Note the word Eloheinu, our God, which is part of prayer, is part of our ritual. And when, when as some other time we have an opportunity to discuss Alterman's religiosity, I will invite you back to this line. I just need for you to note that it is part of a very secular Israeli poetry and always had been the case of Alterman. What I need for you to see is how many writers and artists had took the line of the cypress spare, how the moon is on there. There is a poet that wrote a whole book, the title of which, Tzachi Livni, the title of which is Yareach al Kidon Abrosh, the moon on the cypress spare, just a straight quote from Alterman. There are artistic photographers that will be looking in art, photography, exhibits, and you will find an Alterman line like this, or some other such picture exactly the same, as if photographers were trying to catch the Alterman moment, okay? When the tree looks a, look like a spear and the moon is on top of it. So as we are leaving the lyrical part, I would like for us to take with us three things to remember. I shall never stop looking, I shall never stop breathing, and I shall die and will keep going. Take with you that line as Alterman always, including these two parts, undividable, of human existence, alive and dead, and for him they are always meshed. The second and old side too has its moment of birth, the ultimate invitation to look again and look again afresh at every banal thing of your life because it will have a moment of rebirth, and the commitment to say a blessing, not to forget the great deeds around us. Never shall the sorrow of your great playthings be plucked from me. Avinu Shabashamayim, Eloheinu, etc. This is just a bit. It's really a taste from that amazing world of Alterman poetry, just so that you know in case you're looking for more. There is very little Alterman translated into English, but the two most important books following Kochavim Bachutz are Simchat Aniyim, The Happiness, the Gladness of the Poor, and Shirei Makot Mitzrayim, the poetry of the Ten Plagues of Egypt. These are the three early, most important poetic books of Alterman that you may want to have a look at if you continue to study him. As we go into the next part, well, Alterman is our night editor, first at Haaretz, at the time the following poem will be published, later for many, many years at Davar. Oddly enough, speaking about a Tel Aviv secular port, as I'm leading you into the next poem, I'd like to remind you, not that I think you do not know it, and yet it's always good to remember a very important central prayer that we say normally at the high holidays. Ata bechartanu mikol ha'amim, ahavta otanu v'ratzita banu. ורוממתנו מכל הלשונות, וקידשתנו במצוותיך, וקרבתנו מלכנו לעבודתך, ושמך הגדול והקדוש עלינו קראת. You have chosen us from all the people, you have loved us and taken pleasure in us, and have exalted us above all tongues. You have sanctified us by your commandments, and brought us near unto your service, O our King, and have called us by your great and holy name. Why? Why am I wasting precious minutes of this short hour? Because I know how oftentimes, both in Israel and outside, we are creating this artificial divide between Israelis who are secular and Israelis that are observant. And we will tag the secular as if having nothing to do with Jewish ritual, with Jewish uh, traditional texts, etc. And the reality is so very, very different. Alfred did have a classical traditional Jewish education, but he lived a very non-observant secular life. He is the poet of secular Israel of his time. And yet, references to prayer, 
references to Midrash, references to Tanakh, will always exist, even in the most secular Israeli poetry. Ask me about it at some other lecture, but now we are going to a particular date. So I'm starting with a telegram from the year 1942 sent to the representative of the World Jewish Congress based in Switzerland from a businessman who writes to him and it is to be forwarded to Stephen Wise. I have received through foreign office following message from a, an over in Geneva stop received alarming report that in Führer's headquarters plan discussed and a, under consideration all Jews in countries occupied a, or controlled by Germany numbers this and that to four, three and a half to four millions should after deportation and concentration in the East at one a blow be exterminated to resolve one and for all the Jewish question in Europe. The Rigner telegram comes in 1942 in the late summer. And it's not that people did not know anything about what is happening in Nazi-occupied Europe, but here comes the proof the documentation that Nazi Germany is planning to execute a systematic killing of all the Jews. It will be told and said and published in America. It will be published in Israeli newspapers or British Mandate Palestine newspapers. The State of Israel does not exist any yet. And Alterman is the right night editor and he will be receiving these news. And so, in November of 1942, he will publish a very important poem in the series of those poems when he is relating to contemporary events. He is relating to what the news have brought forward, but he is talking about it in conjunction with the prayer we just have read. So we may consider, some of you may consider, that this in a way is disrespectful. Some of you may consider that this is even sacrilegious. And yet, think about the mood that when you are living relatively safely in the land of Israel, and you hear that all of our people back in Europe under Nazi occupation are now on their way to be killed. We are living 75 years about it after the Holocaust, and yet it is inconceivable for us to believe what had happened. Imagine yourself at the time. Would you at all believe that that is possible? Alterman does. We'll do a little bit of the Ivrit and then work our way through the English. <laughs> את חמת העולם לא שמענו, כי אתה בחרתנו מכל העמים, אהבת אותנו ורצית בנו. כי אתה בחרתנו מכל העמים, מנורבגים, מצ'כים, מבריטים, ובצעוד ילדינו אל גרדומים, ילדים יהודים, ילדים חכמים, הם יודעים כי דמם לא נחשב בדמים, הם קוראים רק להם אל תביטי. When... Of all the people, Mikol Ha'amim, the title itself is a reference to the prayer we have just read. When under the gallows our children cried, we did not hear the world's wrath. For of all the people you selected us, for us you loved and sanctified. For you selected us of all the peoples, those of France, Jap Japan, and Norway. And when our children march to the gallows, smart Jewish kids, they all know that their blood does not count and say, Mom, turn your eyes the other way. The iron devoured day and night. <coughs> and, the <coughs> and the holy Christian father in the city of Rome did not come out with the icons of Christ 
to stand one day in a pogrom. The Hebrew said, Lo yatsa meheichalam im tzalmei hagoel la'amod yom echad ba pogrom. To stand one day, one single day, where for years, like a lamb, a small, unknown Jewish kid stands alone. Great is the worry about sculptures and painting, lest those our treasures are destroyed in a raid. But the heads of infants, our treasures they are, are smashed to the walls and crushed to the ro on the roads. Their eyes are begging, Mom, do not look and don't see. Don't see us lying, lying in a long rose on the ground. We are f famous old soldiers, only short inside, aren't we? They say with their eyes a few more words. We know, God of our forefathers, that you selected us of all the kids in the world, that you loved and pampered us more than all the other that of all the kids in the world, us you selected to be killed at the feet of your throne, and our blood in small vases you collected, because no one else would, only you alone. And you small, smelled it like flowers, and you marked with it your scarf, and for it you will charge both the killers and the silence keepers. July 1942, I'm sorry about mistake I made earlier about the months. A few things that I would like to draw your attention. I know this is an extremely painful poem, and yet let us try to look a little bit at the details. First of all, look at the repetition. Ata b'chartanu, ata b'chartanu, ata b'chartanu. It is repeated time and again just like we do when we pray. The ritual of prayer is a ritual of repetition. And Alterman is using that very same technique, if you wish, methodology of calling again and again attention to the fact of chosenness. And now a word about translation that in this case, may be semi-prophetic. The Hebrew ancient ritual word is bechira, bacharta banu. The English is not a biblical word, is not a ritual word, is the word selected, which calls into attention, obviously, the Nazi selections. You know what? I'm not even sure that by July 42, People outside of Europe or Auschwitz would know the term selection in the meaning it acquired in those years. So maybe the translator here, the poem having been translated later, is already more knowledgeable than the poet who had used the classical word of Bechira not juxtaposing it with that other chosenness, the chosen people have become the selected people. But the, both the Hebrew and the English we give us this value. Note another two elements that we had looked at before we leave this poem. The critique of the Pope, which in 42 is not as strong as we will come to experience much later. You know, the war, the Holocaust, they lasted until 1945. Already in 42, Alterman knows that this will be the case, that the Pope will not get out of his seat, will not get out on the streets of Rome and proclaim, and with the picture of the Savior, etc., etc. How does he know? Another item that will, is very, very low-key in these years before the major bombing of Europe by the Allies will occur in later years of the war. And Altman already knows that there will be people who will be very concerned about be beautiful art being destroyed, and he already calls them 
to attention and to order and say you care so much about the art and what about the living children? Are they not art enough for you? But of all the other things that I could point to you as foreshadowing a much later discourse, I'd like to draw your attention to the very last lines of the poem. So I took away everything else. So indeed, you focus on the last lines, and I even chose a different color. I'm going to read the Ivrit again. And for it, the blood that he smells like flowers, you will charge both the killers and the silence keeper. Why? Why do I want for you to pay attention here to these last lines? Because I can tell you that scholarly literature that is discussing this poem will draw our attention to the fact that our ability to talk about the Holocaust, the Shoah, in terms of perpetrators, victims and bystanders, the silent ones, is a much later phenomena. People did not use that language. People were talking about condemning the perpetrators. Yes, for sure. People were talking about being in pain for the victims. Absolutely. But drawing attention to the importance of the role of the bystanders is something totally not typical of these early years during World War II. So again, a note of the ability of Alterman to say well ahead of time things that will take the majority of us a much longer time to look at. So take with you this package of the first poem that we read from that collection of Shirei Ha'et Ve'aiton, unlike the following one, the two following ones, that come to us from Hatur Shvi'i, the seventh column that collects all the poems that Alterman had written when he was working, in the 30 years he was working for the Var. This one comes from his last year at Haaretz, yet in the books, of the seven column, it is traditional to include this particular one so you can find it, although it was not published in the seventh column, it is published in the books dedicated to the seventh column. Very few, obviously, English translations of the seventh column by Alterman, but we continue to yet another one. For this, I'd like to start with the picture in the middle and Immediately after that, I will address myself to the poem. I am showing you the clandestine immigrant boat Max Nordau that was caught by the Brits, 46. We still do not have the state of Israel, but we do have people, Holocaust survivors, who are trying to come into the land of Israel through that which you call in English the clandestine immigration, or Aliyah Bet in Hebrew, or Ha'apala. Why am I showing you this picture? It's for you know, honesty and transparency, because I have a personal connection to the story of the clandestine immigration. The poem we are going to read is not about this boat. I'll tell you about which boat it is, but the Max Nordau is the boat my parents came on. And if you look at the lower row of people leaning out to watch as they approach the port of Haifa, the picture was taken from the port of Haifa, you can see as fourth from the right, a woman with a white top. That is my mother of blessed memory. And if you look very, very carefully, no, you cannot see that, I'm kidding. But she was already a five months pregnant with me at the time. No, four. I was born in October of that year. So in a certain way, you can think of me as a person who came to Israel as a clandestine immigrant. Obviously, I do not have very clear memories of the uh, event. I now want to show you the real boat. This is mom. Uh, I want to show you the boat about which the poem was written a few months earlier. 
So this is the boat. It's called the Hanasenesh. Oddly enough, some connection to my family story, as the boat is named after that Hungarian Jewish woman, Hanasenesh, uh, and my family comes uh, from Hungary as well. And uh, Nathan Alterman is invited by the Palmach people to attend one of these events when they are successfully bringing a boat to the shore in Naharia, north of Haifa. They had to abandon the boat after that because they brought it too close to the shore. And the title of the poem is Neum Tshuva Lerav Cholivlim Italki Acharei Lel Horada. What a title. A response to an Italian captain. The English, the English does not have a, the whole title in Hebrew. It says, after a night of successfully bringing the immigrants in. We are doing only the English for the sake of saving time. Imagine the event. Let me show you the picture again. This is how the people were brought in. And Alterman invited by the commanders to sit there on the coast, on the beach, and watch what is happening. It is said that after that, they had an improvised party, and the Italian captain made, made a very emotional speech. So when Alterman decides to do his journalistic writing about this, already at the VAR, he composes it as an answer to the Italian captain. The wind lashes and the sea and the sea lashes at the ship. The task was completed. Holy Moses, we drink to you, captain, and lift the glass high. We'll meet again on these waters of Nashuv Nipagesh Alamain. No Lloyds would ensure your small secret craft, nor the perilous struggle it wages. But though in a ship's log no record be kept, we'll chart it in the history pages. In this frail hidden fleet, gray and silent song of, and of history and story, and many a captain who hears of the tale will envy you, captain, your glory. The night hid the battle with wave and with tide, but our lads, then the storm wind were stronger, O oh, captain, you saw how from ship to the shore, each swam with a refugee on the shoulder. The Hebrew, of course, is himnosim et amam ale shechem. They carry their people, as the people of Israel, on their shoulders. We are, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, glorious poem, and you can read all of it. And this is Alterman the Bard telling you the story. And we are going to the next page and to the second verse on that. Years to come, you'll be sipping a glass of mulled wine or quaffing a draught that is stronger. Then you'll smile, smoke your pipe, and shake your gray head and think of the days you were younger. And I'm skipping another one. Then we will tell you the gates of the land are open. They are open for quite some time now, thank God, opened by the lads who clambered abroad and carried ashore their precious load. So again, the question rises. Ladies and gentlemen, this is December 1945. That moment of May 1948, when Ben-Gurion will stand in Tel Aviv and say, he, Medinat Israel, and will declare the state, is still practically three years ahead in the future. And he can see, because Alterman can see. This is a poem that I have decided to present to you rather than do the famous silver platter. It is almost as famous as that one, and also deals with those days towards the state and the creation of the state and the people who live in Israel bringing into the land on their shoulders the refugees, the Holocaust survivors. Take a deep breath because we are plunging ahead. Yeah, Yom Yavo, and we will tell you this is my really mark here for us to take away from this poem. I'm taking you to the years 1948-49. And the state is already declared. 
and we have a government and we have a parliament and it has representative. We have won the war and many of the former Arab population had been. Use your ideological language. I don't care, I'm not going into politics. Run away, were kicked out, persuaded by their leaders. I don't care which language you use, but they are not anymore within the borders of Israel. Some of them, however, in the early year or so of our independence, when the borders are set, are trying at night to come back, to pick up some more stuff from home, to visit a relative, to pick up some fruit from their orchard. And the Israeli army, obviously, is controlling that and is objecting to that. Here's a guy I need for you to meet, Tawafik Tubi. He was a member of the Knesset, and look from the page of the Knesset how many cohorts of the Knesset he had served on, 1 to 12, the longest to this day, an Arab and a communist. When he had to say what he had to say, almost all members of Knesset opposed him viciously, and David Ben-Gurion, the Minister of Defense, had said that Tufik Tubi words are a defamation of the state of Israel. This is the atmosphere when Alterman will write his poem, The Reprimand to Tawafik Tubi. To show you what it took to be the whistleblower against Ben-Gurion at the time, I'd like to show you that the, on that very day that his column appears, the paper carries a news about the infiltrators. The paper carries an article against Tufik Tubi. Israel is burying the people who had fallen in the battles of the War of Independence, finally bringing them to their final rest. These are not easy days. And it is in these not easy days that at the Knesset, this Arab member of the Knesset is speaking against the conduct of the IDF as they are searching. Okay. So, who, who, so who is Tawafik Tubi? I'm starting from the poem. The title is The Reprimand to Tawafik Tubi, and there is a motto that describes what had happened in the Knesset. So, who is Tawafik Tubi? He is a member of a Knesset, an Arab communist in the parliament. He sits there with full right and not out of charity. Perhaps it's time to remember this, Chavirim, ladies and gentlemen, that you are not doing him any favor. It's a democracy. He owes us no debt for greatness of soul. His position is legal. It is a commandment. It is as basic as Aleph Bet, ABC. No, the parliament should not, with waving hand, throw a get like a divorce at him once in a while. And it should not, under any circumstances, tell him, you are speaking freely because I am good, I am generous, a supporter of freedom. It is not appropriate even in a private party. It is time to decide at last, like all other representatives, 2B2 is there by virtue of the regime. And if this is serious, we should not hand him a bill to be paid for the right every other day. This is the nature of the democracy. Its squires should not creditors be. It is not easy, but if not self-evident, it will not be evident at all. So the think this young democracy is not even barely a year old, and Altman is there against the noise in the Knesset, against the opinion of the prime minister, who is also the minister of defense, calling for the right of the representatives of the minority to express their opinion. We are reaching our closure. We had a taste of the lyric. We had a taste of the contemporary. 
we could continue with this poem, and you will on your own. Uh, let us just read the last verse. If a communist Arab had asked for it, it is no reason to tear the request apart. No, especially as it seems this time, he is doing what the government had not done. He is calling for just clarification of how the army behaves where they're doing the searches for the infiltrators. I think that among you may be many who in earlier years in Jewish summer camps or schools or youth movements have come across Shir Ha'imik, which is a song, lyrics, that Altman had written for a movie that was made in the year 1934. So Altman was a very young person, 34 years of age. It was a movie, what can I tell you, made for the purposes of fundraising in America. So it had English subtitles. Altman had written three songs for it. And the most famous one is the Valley Song. And let us quickly go through the lines. So do below and moon above from Beit Alpha to Nahalal. What from night to night, silence in the valley, sleeve valley, land of glory, we stand guard on you. That commitment of the pioneers to let the valley sleep so they, even after hard work, can stand guard for it. I want to draw your attention to a stanza that will be sung. We will listen to this, and this will be our closure, that you maybe do not know. Look at the one before last. Darkness upon Mount Gilboa. A horse gallops from shadow to shadow. The sound of a cry flies upward upon the field of the valley of Jezreel. Who fired and who fell there between Bet Alpha and Nahalal? The producers of the movie did not want this sad stanza. So they created for us the beautiful song that we will be listening to right now. I want you to remember that Alterman was not for the simple beauty, even when he was 24. Let us enjoy the singing. Thank you very much for listening to this, and I hope you can sing along with us as we go. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed the movie, and I would like to say goodbye to you on my last slide, which shows you Nordau Street in Tel Aviv. And at Nordau Avenue number 30 is the home where Nathan Alterman 
his wife, the actress Rachel Marcus, and their daughter, Tirza Atar, a poet by her own right, had lived, and all three people's memory is commemorated on the wall of that building. I'm saying that so that you know that when you come to Israel, we can have a wonderful tour of Tel Aviv and just reciting Altaman poems all along a beautiful trail in his beloved city of Tel Aviv. Thank you very much for being part of this tonight. Tudarba from Yerushalayim this time.